Are you ready to get demonetized? Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! Huffington Post is known to be quick to come to the defense of Islam when it's being criticized. More than anything, this seems to be an attempt to defend Muslims against discrimination. I think their intentions are good, but they make the same mistakes that far-right critics of Islam often make, just in the opposite direction. They made a video in defense of Islam a while back where they do themselves a serious disservice. Let's take on their claims in that video, one by one. We need to talk about Islam. You know that religion with 1.6 billion people comprising about 25% of the world's population? Yeah, that Islam. You see, Islam is currently the world's second largest religion. Christians, don't worry, you're still number one. Even though it's been around for 1,400 years, Islam is still woefully misunderstood, especially in the United States. Despite what your crazy but lovable uncle says on Facebook, Islam does not promote hate. I'm not commanded to kill the infidels. I'm not here to talk about the true teachings of Islam, because I don't think there is any true interpretation of Islam, as Islam isn't theologically true, and I don't think it's internally consistent. What I will say, though, is that plenty of Muslims' interpretations disagree with the host statement here. Here's a map of Muslim populations and a map of sexual inequality that Rationality Rules shared in a previous video of mine. Here's an article about a poll showing that at least half of British Muslims think homosexuality should be illegal. And this is nothing compared to the attitudes in places like Egypt, Iran, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia, where homosexuality is a punishable offense based on their Islamic law. As far as killing infidels goes, again, a large number of Muslims disagree with this host. Among Muslims who follow Sharia throughout the Middle East, a majority say that apostates should be killed. It sounds like this host's interpretation of Islam is different from all those Muslims, though, so good for him. One person just can't take their interpretation and say it's the only one to consider when looking at Islam, especially when so many other Muslims' interpretations are so vastly different. Quran. The Quran, as a whole, promotes faith, hope, and peace. So, when you see stuff like this, know that it's always taken out of context. Interesting that Huffington Post would make this point. Let's try something here. Evangelical Christianity as a whole promotes hope, faith, and peace. When you see stuff like this, know it's always taken out of context. The reason Huffington Post's argument can be so easily turned on them is that they're treating the Quran as if it has an objective interpretation, one of peace. The issue is, literary meaning is not objective. Two people can interpret the same text differently, and neither one is necessarily more correct. The way to determine what a text promotes most objectively is to study the behaviors of those who follow that text. If we see that a large portion of the population following a certain text commit a behavior because of their devotion to that text, then that text promotes that behavior. Use this approach, take a look at the statistics I already presented, and then tell me what the Quran promotes. And if you don't believe me, let's ask the experts. If I were to open up um, a book like Harry Potter and just chose one line where it's the excruciatus spell, where it's like, cause the most pain you possibly can and say, this is what Harry Potter is teaching. That's sort of how people look at the Quran. The reason why people like to cite those individual seemingly violent verses in the Quran is because some people really do abide by those verses as literal commands. Personally, I don't think it's very useful to cite specific verses in order to say that Islam is a certain way. I'd rather look at how Muslims actually behave based on their understanding of Islam. Still, if you cite a specific verse like the meme they showed earlier did, you are, however clumsily, describing a message that some Muslims do take from the Quran. The reason why no one bothers to rally against Harry Potter using excerpts from its pages which make it seem violent is because no one is acting violently in the name of Harry Potter. Sharia. Politicians seem to be obsessed with this Arabic word. What is this thing that we call Sharia? Sharia. Sharia. And Sharia. 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 51% highly respected number of polling groups want to be governed according to Sharia. You know what Sharia is. A lot of people don't actually know what Sharia is. Sharia is often translated as law. It doesn't really mean that. It means a path or a guidance. How do you give charity? How do you get married? How do you pray? It's guidelines on how to live your life. I totally agree that a lot of people don't actually know what Sharia is, but the picture painted here is incomplete to the point of being misleading. Sharia is a prescribed path which is considered mandatory for Muslims to follow, and it's laid out in both the Quran and Hadith. 
It contains edicts which are pretty mundane, like its call for charity, but it also has others which are more extreme, like its call for cutting off the hands of thieves. Of course, it can be interpreted in a myriad of ways, and certain Muslims promote violent punishments based on Sharia, while others don't. Many Muslims in the U.S., for instance, reportedly follow their interpretation of Sharia and do so without breaking any laws set by the U.S. government. On the other hand, governments and cultures in countries like Egypt, Iran, and Saudi Arabia enforce more literal interpretations of Sharia in blatant violation of basic human rights. Try for at least a little nuance, Huffington Post. Imagine if I said, Mosaic law as described in Leviticus is guidance. How do you give charity? How do you get married? How do you pray? It's guidelines on how to live your life. While that would be accurate in a very narrow sense, those knowledgeable about the Old Testament would realize that I'd be intentionally covering up Mosaic Law's dark side with my flowery language. It would just be a lie by omission. Oh, uh, and an FYI, trolls, there are currently zero bills in Congress trying to institute Sharia. That's a conspiracy theory, and a pretty dumb one. That's correct as far as I know, but I'm not sure that anyone is even arguing that's the case. This is just a total straw man argument. The questions at hand are along the lines of, should we allow religious exemptions to the law so that Muslims can follow Sharia more literally? One can also oppose Sharia and culture without ever bringing up legal issues. And with people like Linda Sarsour advocating for Sharia in the US while being propped up by the left, concern about Sharia's acceptance in the West is legitimate. Jihad. America is only familiar with jihad in its most violent form, the idea that Islam should defend itself against those who wish to tear it down. It's an Arabic word that means exerted effort or struggle to better oneself. So Muslims can do a jihad to get more sleep, to go out on more dates, to get their lazy butt off the ground and hit the gym, all legitimate forms of jihad. Again, they're committed to telling only half the story. Jihad can totally mean what they said it means, but as I'm sure we all know, it can also mean something extremely sinister. Extremists call their extremism jihad, while peaceful Muslims call their struggle against sin jihad. If we're actually trying to understand Islam, it's important to know both sides of the coin. Hijab! There is a strange, sick obsession with Muslim women who cover their hair. The internet is filled with images and commentary about Muslim women fashion and appearances written by people who frankly don't understand it or are afraid of it. In the Quran, there are about two, two verses amongst 6,000 verses that address how we should conduct ourselves when we talk about modesty. Hijab is actually not a word that's used in the Quran. I, I choose to dress this way. It, for me, it really is an outside expression of an inward experience. This video is incredibly well-crafted in its delivery of misinformation by implication and its lying by omission. The effort to minimize the commandment to wear the hijab is astounding. The Quran not using the word hijab doesn't mean that the commandment isn't there. In chapter 24, verse 31, the Quran commands that women wear a head covering that drapes down to their chests. That's the hijab. Whether or not women do actually choose to wear the hijab is a serious question, and not one we should shy away from given the ramifications of the answer either way. We have to consider that right now, women in Iran are being arrested for taking off their hijabs in public. Do they have a choice in wearing the hijab? I think the answer is obvious. In the West, the question of choice is a bit more complex. While the hijab is not enforced by law, it can be enforced through social consequences and indoctrination. To illustrate this, allow me to share an experience of my own. Growing up, I could technically choose not to go to church, but if I didn't, I'd be lectured, looked down upon, disappoint my family, and even be punished. Plus, I thought that I'd be doing something so sinful that my life would crumble if I stopped going. That remained true for me even through college. Was I ever really given a fair choice as to whether or not to attend church? I think most will agree the answer is no. Now, just replace the going to church with wearing the hijab, and we understand the position in which even moderate Muslim women in the West find themselves. If you're encouraged to wear the hijab in the same way that I was encouraged to attend church growing up, you wearing the hijab is not a choice. When women in Islam are pressured to wear the hijab at the same level that the average Catholic woman is pressured to dress like a nun, I'll consider it a choice. But I wonder, would those at Huffington Post just write me off here because I'm not Muslim or female? I totally get blowing off criticism by radicals, but we have to consider ideas from outside of Islam to understand this issue. Would you only listen to defensive Christians if you were trying to better understand homophobia in the Bible? People tend to think Muslim women are limited, and honestly, some are. However, 
Reality check. There have been way more female heads of state in Muslim countries than in the United States. There definitely have been more female heads of state in some Muslim-majority countries than in the U.S. because some of them have had one female president or prime minister, while the U.S. has never had a female president. That's great for them, and I'm happy to see that. But does that mean that those countries actually have greater gender equality? Unfortunately, no. There are a few Muslim countries, such as Saudi Arabia, that limit uh, Muslim women's rights. They're taking God-given rights that God has given to women and imposing their own views and opinions and what it is that women need to do and not do. They're the ones that are contradicting um, this Islam. They're the ones that are bringing in alien influences into the faith, not the other way around. Okay, she opposes Saudi Arabia's oppressive government. That's cool. But in disagreeing with them, she's reasoning no differently than them. Her theological understanding is based on interpretation that is no less subjective than any Saudi Arabian rulers. If someone from Saudi Arabia saw this video, do you know what their argument against moderates like her would probably be? It'd be something like this. They're imposing their own views and opinions and what it is that women need to do and not do. They're the ones that are contradicting um, Islam. They're the ones that are bringing in alien influences into the faith, not the other way around. The point is, why would we as outsiders just believe that people like her represent a true interpretation of Islam when their arguments can just be shot right back at them? Your mom! Bringing in alien influences into the faith. No, you. Arab. I mean, Arab. Do not assume an Arab equals a Muslim or a Muslim equals an Arab. Let me break it down. Muslim is a term that refers to a person who follows the religion of Islam. Arab is a cultural, linguistic, and ethnic term broadly referring to Arabic-speaking people in the Middle East and North Africa. There are millions of non-Muslims in Arab-majority countries who happen to be Christian, Zoroastrian, Baha'i, even atheists. I obviously don't have any disagreement with them on this because they're exactly right on this point. And not that Huffington Post is doing this in this video, but if you hear a non-Arab criticize the ideas of Islam, don't call them racist. Islam is not a race. I bring this up because even people like Yasmin Mohammed, an Arab herself, get regularly called racist for criticizing Islam, and that's often by people who adamantly remind others of this religious versus racial distinction. Hopefully, this has cleared up some of the garbage that jams up your news feed. And remember, Islam, like any other religion, is complex and requires more than one video to understand it. So, keep reading, talk to actual Muslims, visit a mosque, and remember, an entire religion can never be summed up in just one meme. I actually totally agree with their closing points. One video or one meme is not enough to explain Islam, nor is meeting just one or two Muslims. So go watch more videos about it, read about it. Definitely do go out and meet Muslims or even visit a mosque. Just as importantly though, go meet and listen to ex-Muslims and get their side of the story. As much as the Huffington Post encouraged viewers to seek out a more complex understanding of Islam with their closing comments, they failed to do so themselves throughout this video. In their attempt to combat negative generalizations about Islam, they don't actually provide any nuance, but just throw out positive generalizations about Islam. If you want to actually defeat what you think are bad ideas, you need to demonstrate their flaws from an objective standpoint, not just throw out empty rhetoric in the opposite direction. People on both ends of the political spectrum make the same mistakes in discussing Islam and Muslims. I'll go over two more of them in closing. One, Islam is not a monolith. So the only way to fairly judge a Muslim is not by the name of their religion, but by the content of their character as an individual. That means not thinking that all Muslims are bad people just because bad ones exist, or thinking that they're all good people because good ones exist. Two, the overwhelming majority of the victims of Islamic oppression and terror are Muslims. They're the ones dying most from violent attacks, and they're the ones being oppressed by their own ideas. So don't disparage them by calling them inhuman names like I've seen some of my commenters do. And definitely don't act like Islamic oppression isn't a massive problem. Either way, that's kicking the victims of Islam while they're down. Please help your fellow human beings by learning about Islam and overall elevating the discourse surrounding it. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. I highly recommend the Secular Jihadist podcast for learning about the CD side of Islam from a nuanced perspective. The link is in the description. As always, praise be unto Adam, my top patron and personal lord and savior for making this video possible. Go ahead and subscribe. Check out my Patreon. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic. And until next time, stay skeptical.